Hello, and welcome to Learn the Night Orf with me, Caleb. Uh, this is a new series that I'm starting, of course, uh, and I'm hoping it'll be sort of the spiritual successor to my favorite series on the YouTube channel, Learning About It with Lulu. Uh, of course, this is, uh, the idea of these series is that we're introducing all these new ideas, and perhaps they're, they're sort of new to the instructor as well. I am by no means an expert on the Night Orf coming into this series, and so I wanted to take it uh, week by week, looking at lines, doing a, a ton of prep for the lecture. That way the material is still fresh, fresh to me, and so I know which ideas are kind of more confusing, because I can tell you which ideas confused me, and then how I ended up uh, figuring out those complications and arriving at some kind of logical variation. So to kick off the series, I wanted to start with the uh, Bishop E2 line of the Nidorf because it's sort of seen as more of a positional style of game rather than the absurd, crazy Nidorf lines that are uh, just totally theory heavy and end up in some kind of tactical mess. So starting with Bishop E2 was great. And I don't think I'm even going to get through all of the variations in the Bishop E2 lines, but we're going to make some good headway uh, this week in the first installment of the series. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it here. The Night Orf, of course, arises after e4. Uh, let me actually flip. Uh, we have c5, knight f3, d6, d4 for the open Sicilian, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, attacking the e4 pawn, and so knight c3 by white. And now a6 is the starting position of the Night Orf variation. Uh, a6, of course, is a multi-purpose move, just as a short introduction to the Night Orf. Uh, one idea is to prevent any of these pieces from coming to the b5 square. Uh, this is a useful square for white in many variations. For example, if you play the move e5 here, uh, bishop b5 check is already very, very good for white uh, with knight f5 coming. So a6, guarding the b5 square first and foremost. Secondly, it is actually a preparatory move for black to play b5 himself in many variations. So this is the idea of the knight orf taking away this b5 square on this move 5. Now there are many, many different ways that white can play against the knight orf, uh, and it, is, uh, it does kind of have a reputation as one of the most complex uh, chess openings out there. So today, as I said, we're starting with this move, bishop b2. 6 bishop b2 is the line we're looking at today. And uh, the knight orf way to play is with this move now, e5, kicking this knight away, highlighting the fact that we've guarded this square, so we don't have to worry about any of those uh, checking ideas, or knight b5 ideas. Now there are actually two moves here uh, for white in this position. Uh, the move knight f5 isn't really a move because uh, the move d5 is going to be a good response. So knight f3 and knight b3 are the two main moves here for white. Uh, knight b3 has been played many, many more times, but knight f3 lately has been kind of made popular by the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Uh, so to start with today, I'm going to look at the more popular variation with knight b3. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, well, of course, we're moving this, removing this knight from capture, but we're not blocking this f pawn. We're not blocking this diagonal. And this is going to afford white uh, a few more opportunities. Uh, now, from what I've seen, all the ideas in this variation are pretty similar for black, almost no matter what uh, white plays. There's a few kind of main setups that are important to know. So right here, I wanted to kind of introduce a few of those. One setup is with bringing all these pieces to their most natural square, eventually. Uh, and then black, if he goes for this setup, is going to look to play on the queen side with stuff like rook c8, queen c7, bringing this knight either to c4 or up to c5, going for things like b5 and b4 as well. Obviously, that's a lot of arrows, but we'll get into those lines a little bit as well. Another setup is actually with, yes, of course, this bishop here, but then perhaps developing a, a little bit of a less standard way. Uh, we'll, I guess it is pretty standard, but uh, just, just a different way from the first thing we, I drew on the board there. With this bishop coming out to b7, highlighting the fact that the e4 pawn can sometimes be weak. And additionally, depending on what happens, you, you will sometimes see this knight come to c6 rather than, b7, or rather than d7. And so we'll talk about that, uh, that as well. Usually this king does end up castling kingside almost regardless, but you know, all of this in good time. Uh, so moving along here, 
I will say that it is rather important for black to kind of delay the natural looking move bishop e6. Of course, it's all about the d5 square and many of these variations, so bishop e6 looks very natural, but white does have a rather strong reply here. And that reply is going to be this move f4. Uh, f4 is now creating some threats of playing the move f5, creating threats in the center. And with this bishop on e6 already, this is going to be a little bit difficult for black to meet. For example, if queen c7, already a move like g4, and these things are coming with tempo rather quickly. So instead of playing the move bishop e6, the move bishop e7 is by far more common, just delaying this. And now, if the move uh, f4 does come on the board, uh, this is going to be uh, a lot less scary for black because the move f5 won't be coming with tempo. And of course, we're not playing the move bishop e6 here. Uh, but more on that at a later date. For the moment, we're going to focus on move 8 castles. This is kind of the main topic of the lecture tonight, move 8 castles here. This is uh, by far the most common move, and we'll, we'll look at why. So there are a few different ways to play here for black as well. I'm going to recommend that you actually still stay away from playing this move bishop e6, because if you play bishop e6 here, the move f4 can actually still be rather strong. If queen c7, already moves like f5 uh, are, are kind of coming with tempo. And it, it may not be as bad as playing bishop b6 immediately, but you know these are still not the most comfortable positions for black from what I can tell. So rather than playing bishop e6, castles is a perfectly natural move for black. And it's sort of a case of, you know, even if you can, why would you want to uh, play bishop e6? Because as I said, sometimes this bishop does come out along this other diagonal. So castles is the more flexible move, and I do think it is the better move. Uh, now, uh, the main move for white, there are a few of them, but the most popular move is bishop e3. And after this move, bishop e3, this is kind of the green light to develop this bishop out to e6. So now, why is that? Why do you think white moving this bishop to e3 is the go-ahead for black to play bishop e6? What do you think, chat room? What do you think, chat room? Why, after bishop e3, does bishop e6 make more sense? Is it better to play black or white in the Nidorf? In most cases, it's better to have the white pieces, because white moves first. But the Nidorf is one of the most well-respected openings. And uh, you know, as they say, chess is a draw. So I guess neither. He'll lose a tempo when we take, says Muhammad. And that is totally accurate. Now, after bishop e3, if white wants to play this f4 move anyways, now we are actually going to play the move e takes f4. And compared to the other variations, now white would be recapturing at the loss of a tempo. Sort of similar to uh, this idea that we see in the QGD, where black delays taking on c c4 until this bishop is moved from f1. Uh, now, the move rook takes f4 is also potentially playable here, but it's not really going to be that threatening for black. The main advantage of having the bishop on f4 is the pressure you get on d6, and also actually the pressure you get on the e5 square. And with the rook here on f4, white doesn't really get uh, any of that. Just as an example line, knight c6, and now white had better kind of start doing things immediately. So just for example, knight d5, we can capture, capture, and just plant this knight onto e5. And this is going to be a fairly comfortable position now uh, for black. So f4, not the most common here, although it has been tried. Uh, so let's look at what is the most common over a thousand games in this variation with queen d2. And we will definitely branch out to see more, uh, more variations later. Actually, let me spend a little bit more time on f4. Uh, takes, so if rook takes f4, as I said, just knight c6, and we're aiming for e5. If bishop f4 instead, I will say you can just play the same way with knight c6. Uh, and after king h1, rather than playing e f or knight e5 here, the move d5 actually is sort of immediately equalizing here from what I can tell. And the point is, you're just breaking down this pawn on e4. And if the move e5 comes in, black can immediately simplify things by knight d7. Uh, the, d the e5 pawn now is just strictly indefensible. And so trades will ensue. For example here, 
something like this. Knight takes e7, queen takes e7. And uh, black is, is not doing uh, any worse in this position. Uh, you can claim that white has the two bishops, but you would rather actually have this pawn on f7 than this pawn on c2 because it gives you a slight, uh, slightly safer king in most cases. And the other fact of the matter is that all of black's pieces have really reasonable squares. This knight on c6, this knight on e5 is looking at some various hops, and yeah, black is just doing totally, totally fine here. So moving along from f4 now, let's look at this idea with queen to d2. So what is the point of queen to d2? Uh, well, for one, it is clearing the back rank, allowing uh, these rooks to sort of move a little bit more freely. It's also, uh, well, I, I guess that is kind of the main point. It's also, you know, keeping a closer eye on some dark squares here. So, for example, if some crazy thing like 98, now the g5 square is already well in white's grasp. But main point, clearing the back rank for some of these rooks. Uh, now, I think the most natural development here for black is to come to the d7 square with the knight. And this is sort of that uh, main setup I was talking about. Uh, we're already sort of arriving at it here with, uh, with black. You just get all the pieces out. And now, as I said, we're looking for play on the queen side, stuff like rook c8, stuff like queen c7, stuff like b5, stuff like knight b6 to c4, or potentially just knight to c5. These are sort of the, the big ideas here. And this is one of the main, main setups for black that you can uh, employ here against these, these bishop b2 lines. Uh, now, if white isn't careful, the move b5 is going to come on the board, and b5 is, is sort of exactly what uh, black is aiming for here. So by far, uh, the main main move here is a4 for white to prevent this idea. And now I'm going to recommend the move rook c8. It's nice and solid, uh, super simple. You're looking at this backward pawn on c2. Well, not yet backward, but for the moment, uh, loosely defended pawn on c2. As I said, you're also looking at the c5 square and the c4 square. And these are very two, very much two relevant squares in this opening. Now if uh, white sort of takes his time again, we can kind of just go for this knight uh, b6 to c4 idea. And this idea is good enough that I think it's worth uh, preventing for white. So most common move now by far is the move a5 to uh, prevent this exact idea. Now the move queen c7 can come on the board. And there are two moves here for white, uh, rook f to d1 and rook f to c1. Uh, generally, this rook can't really be touched because uh, first and foremost, uh, this pawn is sort of hanging, although immediately I'm blundering some tactics. But this pawn is going to be under defended if you play the move uh, knight c5 here. So just for example, now this rook is already having to come back. So this rook kind of stuck on a1. That's why these are the two moves with the f rook, just to keep the a pawn a little bit more closely defended. Uh, so let's look at rook f to c1 first. Uh, the idea of this move, of course, is to defend the c pawn, allow this knight a little bit of mobility if it ever needs it. And from here, uh, the counterintuitive move, slightly knight c5, does seem to be good enough for black. Uh, now we're, uh, at this point we are just following a game between, uh, which game is this? Oh yes, a game between Ivanchuk and Kramnik uh, all the way back in 2004. And that game went with knight takes c5, d takes c5. Uh, and from here there are once again sort of two ways to play for white. Uh, you can go the concrete approach with an immediate knight d5. Now that this file is well blocked and the threats on c2 are no more, or you can go for a slower approach with f3. So looking at the immediate knight d5 first, uh, here you can simply take this knight, play bishop d6, uh, c4, knight d7, uh, just f3 for example, and already f5. And the point of this position is this pawn is protected and passed, it's true, but the play on the queen side has very much slowed down Black has really great control of the c5 square, which is really the only breakthrough point for white. I mean, if you're not playing b4 and c5, then really what are you doing with white on the queen side? 
and black can sort of remaneuver his pieces to support these kinds of advances on the king's side. Now, if you are a fan of chessable and uh, specifically Alex Korovich, Korlovich, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, uh, you may recognize this position, and I do want to be open that I have actually looked at this chessable course uh, a little bit, and some of these lines are going to end up being similar to his, but I do think I'm offering enough uh, unique and uh, ideas for my own brain that this is not just copying his course. So uh, if you do want a rather complete course on the Nidorf, please check out his course as well. And this is a line that he did recommend, and it does look quite nice for black. Uh, in the meantime, though, I don't think knight d5 is actually the best try for white because this sort of line is, is really rather forcing. And uh, at this point, uh, I think black is, is doing really, really well here. It does really feel like black is the one with all the active ideas in this specific line. Uh, as I said, if white really can't get b4 in, and for the moment it looks as though he can't, then white doesn't have any active ideas on the queen's side. So this one looks good for black, in my opinion. Uh, now the move f3, this is a little bit more of a flexible approach. Of course, you are not immediately going for this locked down structure on the queen's side. And because of that, uh, it is actually allowing black some opportunities here. For example, the move c4 is uh, the big idea now for black. It's sort of a case where white didn't play knight d5 and c4 well he could, so black should go for it now. And if white plays something nonchalant, uh, black has a really nice idea of playing a move like bishop c5 and trading off these bishops in many, many cases. Which is why the main move here is knight a4. It's the move that uh, Ivanchuk played in his game against Kramnik. And now white is aiming for these squares, and so knight d7 is uh, contesting those squares quite nicely. Uh, now if uh, bishop f1, this is the move played in the game uh, of Ivanchuk and Kramnik. Black, once again, has a few ideas here. Uh, rook d8, at first glance, looks really, really natural. And this is actually what uh, Kramnik played in his game. But a little bit later on in that game, uh, Black sort of ran out of ideas. And I was, as I was looking at this position, uh, I was also very much struggling to, to come up with these ideas for Black here. Uh, Kramnik kind of just started shuffling around and, and actually made a mistake or two uh, by bringing this queen out to b5 and allowing some b3 tactics on this long diagonal. Uh, so rather than rook d8, I'm actually going to suggest a different move here, and that move is f5. And this move is a lot less intuitive than rook d8, but the idea is now it, it is really once again going to be black with all the active ideas, which is why I very much uh, do like this line. Uh, e takes f5 is really the only move that makes any sense. If you don't uh, take this pawn, if you uh, pass, for example, now the move f4 is going to be good for black. The move f takes c4 is also just going to be a better version for black with this active rook on the f file. So e takes f5 kind of has to be played. And now a move like rook takes f5 is very, very sensible. Now, uh, after letting the engine run for quite a bit, the best it could come up with is the move knight b6 here for white. And if this is the best that white can do, then white can't do very, very well at all. Uh, this is just a simplifying move. When after bishop c5, take on c5, take on c5, king h1. Uh, the move e4 is really black's last uh, challenge if black plays e4. Uh, I think black should honestly be better if he gets this move in. Once again, because of the king's safety. In this case, uh, the f-pawns would be equal after something like bishop d5, e4, takes, takes. But because the g2 pawn is a light colored pawn, I do think it would once again be black with a slight advantage here because uh, the pressure on g2 is going to be a lot more relevant than the pressure on h7, in my opinion. Uh, a reason for that is the move h6 is a lot more comfortable to play than the move g3. Uh, and so once again, I quite like black's chances here. That's not to say white is doing much worse. Uh, I said black is better if he can get e4 in, but e4, of course, has not yet been played. And so there is still some work to be done here for black. But I do quite like this line with the immediate f5 in response to, uh, to this type of play from white. So once again, 
This all happened after the move rook f c1, the idea of controlling c2. We play the move knight c5 to challenge the e-pawn. White kind of uh, also, of course, this knight on b3. White kind of has to take, otherwise bishop b3 and knight b3 is just a little bit too strong. Uh, d c5, and then rather than knight d5, which would allow black this easy structure, uh, the move f3 is a little bit slower, and so black plays c4, opening up this diagonal, and then we go knight d7 and f5. And this is kind of the main idea that I uh, looked at here. Now, rather than rook f to c1, of course, the move rook f to d1 is very playable uh, as well. And against this move, uh, we are going to play the move uh, rook f to d8. You know, pretty sensible, right? This rook comes here, our rook comes here. And now, after queen e1, once again, the move knight c5 is very much playable. Uh, knight c5, knight takes c5, d takes c5, and we get something similar to what we just looked at, with the key difference that the move knight d5 isn't really even playable in this specific case, because of course this is just a free pawn. Now, if white kind of reverts and plays a move like f3, what's the difference here? Well, not rook d2, but rook takes d1. Uh, bishop takes d1 and c4, and once again, we, we kind of get something similar. With one set of rooks off the board, though, it's, it's not going to be too, too different. For example, knight a4, knight d7, and once again, ideas of f5 are kind of in the air for black. Uh, so instead, rook takes d8, rook takes d8. Uh, king h1 is one way to play. Uh, now the move queen c6, and we are following now Ivan Shuk with the white pieces again, this time against Lok Van Vele. I can't say his name, I apologize. But now f3, c4, and once again, it's very similar stuff to what we were looking at with the addendum that knight d5, once again, is rather impossible. Bishop f1 was played in the game. Uh, and now king f8 was uh, Van Whaley's choice. And the idea here is that king f8 is actually a move that creates a threat, believe it or not. Uh, there is a very uh, favorable move that black would have liked to play in the last turn, but was unable to. So uh, see if you guys can answer at home what that very favorable move black wanted to play was, and then why king f8 allows him to play it. You know, Because there's some reason why this favorable move, uh, favorable move does not work in this case. There's a tactical line, and then king f8 uh, sort of creates the threat. So who knows it? Who knows? Yeah, rook d2 was rather shocking. King f8 suspicious. Well, it looks suspicious, but it is actually very, very logical once you see the idea. <clears throat> Memento Mori says MVL has inspired him to play the Nidorf. Yeah, MVL is sort of the main proponent of the Nidorf in modern top 10 chess. Queen g3 would come with a tempo. So actually, not quite. The idea is black really would love to play this move bishop b4. Bishop b4 sort of locks down white's entire play on the queen side. But unfortunately, tactically, this move is not so good because of the move knight d5. Knight d5, now all of a sudden, these are all threats in the position. For example, bishop takes e1, knight e7 check, king f8, knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop c5 is a check, King e8, we'll say. Rook takes e1, and white is substantially better here. So this knight d5 move is sort of the main reason why king f8 uh, was played in the game. Uh, king f8 creating the threat of bishop b4 so that knight d5 is not good enough. And then, of course, white not wanting to allow this, plays the move knight a4, knight d7. But this is an important idea to keep in mind. So. If bishop b4 is ever playable for you, you should definitely keep an eye on it and try to play this move. Uh, if your opponent prevents it, then of course you can't. But this is sort of the reason behind king f8, and that's why it's not such a bad move after all. Knight a4, uh, knight d7 played in the game. Queen c3, rook c8, queen d2, rook d8, queen c3, rook c8, queen d2, rook d8 was good enough for, uh, for a draw here. Uh, neither player really uh, willing to deviate here. If, for example, rather than queen d2, white tried to something like queen e1, h6 is generally a useful move for black to include, uh, keeping ideas of bishop g5 alive. And if this knight ever steps back to c3, then this bishop comes to b4 uh, once again. And 
if this knight doesn't step to c3, it's sort of a case of all of the white pieces kind of being locked down. Black, white doesn't want to play the move b, uh, b3 because this is definitely going to favor uh, black. If you don't take this immediately, it is going to be weak in the long run. And where else is this knight going to go? It can't really move. If this knight can't move, then this rook can't move. This bishop can't go anywhere. White's definitely not trying to open things up on the king's side with stuff like f4 or anything, because this pawn is weak. And it's just sort of a case where uh, white doesn't have any active ideas. And it very well may be that black doesn't have any good active ideas here either, but that just means that you're going to get something like this grandmaster draw that we saw here with queen c3 and queen d2. Uh, just It's tough to, to make something happen here for white. Uh, you know, in my experience, when that's the case, more often than not, uh, players with white pieces might get a little frustrated and try something that perhaps they shouldn't. So once again, key idea to keep in mind here, knight c3, bishop b4, locks down all of the white pieces. Uh, okay. And that is, I think, all the lines that I wanted to look at involving this move, bishop e3. This is by far the main, main line in this uh, castles variation. Uh, and I know we're, we're moving through rather quickly here, but there is just so, so much content to cover in the Nidorf that I'm trying to fit it all into uh, something a little bit more digestible. So as a quick review, bishop e3 is our go-ahead to play bishop e6, because now f4 is a little bit less intuitive, because after takes and takes, white is losing a tempo. And then we go knight c6 and d5. So rather than f4, uh, white would rather play a move like queen d2. And now we go knight bd7 with the ideas of playing rook c8 and knight b6 to c4 if we're allowed. Or uh, in most cases, as we see here, we're settling for knight c5 because a4, a5 is white's idea to slow us down. So a4, by far the main move. Rook c8, a5, preventing knight b6 to c4. Queen c7, rook d1. Uh, rook d8, or rook f to c1, and the immediate knight c5. The idea, once again, being that this structure is pretty good for black, the idea of bringing this knight to d7 and pushing f5 when white is sort of blocked on the queen side. And if white takes his time, uh, these ideas of playing an early f5 here are the ones that I like. Rook d1 is more of the same, with knight c5 quickly to follow and more of these ideas of playing c4 and arriving at these types of positions where everything is uh, just a bit locked down. And we arrive at this draw in the Ivanchuk Van Veli, or Van Veli, Van Veli, I can't say his name, in their game. Uh, okay, moving along, I wanted to take a look at another line here. Uh, let's look from Black's perspective again. In the Nidorf, arriving here, knight b3, bishop b7, castles, castles. And now, rather than bishop e3, we saw bishop e3 as the go-ahead to develop our bishop out to e6. Because white sometimes wants to keep, keep these f4 ideas alive, you'll see them play this sort of kg move, king to h1. And this is a very, very clever waiting move. The idea is now, if we do play the move bishop e6, now f4 is coming on the board once again. And king h1 is a very, very useful move for white to have included here. So after takes takes, it's not as though white is losing a tempo. He's used this tempo to bring his king off of this long diagonal uh, that is now open. So this is something uh, that I believe black should, should very much try to avoid. The other idea of this is that if the move b5 comes on the board, this is sort of an intuitive uh, good move for black. Immediately the move a4 comes on the board to challenge these pawns. This more or less uh, is asking black to play the move b4. And now knight d5. And if we take this guy, queen takes and rook a7. And this just isn't the most comfortable now for, uh, for black. Definitely some untangling has to be done in lines like this. So rather than sort of oblige white and play one of these moves that he's hoping to see, uh, the move b6 has become the main reply here for black in response to king h1. And the idea of b6 is it's just like b5, except now a4 isn't going to be uh, immediately going down these lines where b4 is forced for black that give uh, white this kind of initiative. Uh, so now, once again, there are a couple ways to play. 
uh, if you do see the move bishop e3. Now, after b6, of course, we are aiming for the second setup that I mentioned, with this bishop coming out to b7, and we are just challenging the f3 pawn. Now, after f3, having seen white waste these two tempi on bishop e3 and f3, and having gotten this bishop out to b7 to control d5, black is now much better prepared to meet a4, so that's why you see the move b5 be played here. Uh, a4 is still by far the most popular response for white in response to this move. But now after b4, knight d5, we can simply take this guy. And of course, queen takes is no longer playable with our bishop here on b7. So e takes d5 instead. And now just a move like knight d7. And it's going to be a, a comfortable game once again for black. The idea is revolving around this uh, d5 pawn actually being a little bit weakened, uh, a little bit overextended perhaps. And that's why you see moves like c3 or c4. Either way, black can take. And now bishop g5 is a good move for black in many, many cases to activate this bishop. For example, bishop f2, queen c7, c4, a5, getting the bishop out uh, in this manner. Uh, knight d2, bishop takes d2. And this was good enough for uh, Zhu Wenjun to get a pretty favorable end game. Uh, eventually in her game against Anna Muzichuk in the Women's World Championship back in 2010. Uh, Ju and Jun had this with the black pieces and did actually end up winning uh, what should have been a drawn rick end game, but she definitely did have the favorable side. Once again, the idea is just bishop a6 and black has a nice hold on the queen side. No real weaknesses for white to look at. You could argue maybe this pawn on a5, but black with very much two solid weaknesses that he can sort of, uh, he or she, in this case, can sink his or her teeth into. And that's why we saw Ju and Jun go on to win this game. So the idea, bishop e3, and now after bishop e7, sort of forcing f3 to defend this pawn, now black has the go-ahead to play b5. Now, understandably, players with the white pieces have sort of wanted to avoid allowing black to get all this space with b5 now that uh, you're adequately prepared to meet knight d5 with this bishop on b7. Because of that, they have started kind of delaying this bishop e3 move and either playing a4 immediately or first defending this pawn, bishop b7, and then playing a4. The idea now being, of course, that b5 is uh, prevented before it ever got started. This is why they have delayed developing this bishop to the natural e3. Uh, now, in this case, I am going to talk about this move a4 a little bit and uh, why white isn't just always playing it, right? It seems like a very, very useful move in pretty much every case here because b5 is a useful move for black in pretty much every case. So why doesn't white just always play this move a4 before b5 ever happens? And the reason for that, from what I can tell, is that it does come with a pretty significant downside. And that downside is that this b4 square now falls under black's control. So uh, pretty much in every line that I've looked at where a4 ends up getting played in these types of positions, that is sort of the green light to develop this knight not to d7, but instead to c6. So in most cases, this knight comes to d7, looks for ideas of knight b6 to c4, or alternatively, knight to c5, as we saw in those first variations. But now with this pawn on a4, we want to bring this knight to c6. And the reason for that, of course, is because white has loosened his grip on this b4 square. And from b4, this knight does an excellent job of protecting d5. Uh, and as always in the knight orf, it's about the d5 square. So knight c6 here is the recommendation. Uh, now bishop g5 is the main move, trying to loosen black script on this d5 square. But now the simple knight b4. Uh, and now this knight on b4 is so strong, in fact, that in all 28 times this position has been reached, the move knight to b1 has been played. The simple idea here being c3 would remove this knight from its b4 outpost, and this is sort of a necessity at this point for white to get rid of this knight. And now the move a5 is actually very, very nice for black. Uh, and this is how the game went in Ivanchuk against Adiban. Uh, uh, Ivanchuk reaching these kinds of positions with the white pieces a lot, and a myriad of players uh, reaching them with the black pieces here. 
Uh, and in that game, the move knight a3 was chosen, not immediately kicking the knight back. If c3 does get played here, the point of a5 was to grant our knight this a6 square, when now it's coming to the very, very natural c5 square uh, to follow. Uh, notably, this I do think is a better version uh, of the lines we were looking at before, because with this pawn on c3, there's no knight ready to jump into d5, and this knight on b1 is not really ideally placed for, uh, for white here. In the game though, knight a3 was played, defending this guy, and because now this knight has not been booted away, Adiban took the opportunity to play d5 and was doing absolutely fine in this game against Ivanchuk. c3, knight a6, takes takes, eb5, bishop d5, and it's pretty clear to see that black should not be any worse here with an extra pawn in the center and the two bishops. Uh, black is doing totally, totally fine here. The game continued for a bit, but black found himself in no real danger. This knight coming to c5, and excellent control over the light squares in the white camp here. Uh, and actually, I guess the game didn't last too long. Rook a d1, bishop c8, rook fe1. And actually, no, the game did last a long, long time. I was wrong. It's just the annotation was put here. This was Ivanchuk Adiban from the Tournament of Peace in 2018. Uh, okay. And so that is sort of the story of the move 9, king h1. Once again, this is a waiting move by white, trying to, bla trying to bait black into playing one of the two natural moves against bishop e6. Now f4 has gained in power with this bishop coming to f4 in one turn. And against b5, a4 is a pretty good reply for white, which is why the move b6 is the most popular move for black, not allowing white either of these opportunities with a4 or f4. Now if bishop e3, play continues very naturally, like this, with b5 to follow, now that we're prepared to meet a4, b4, knight d5, and if white tries to be clever and plays a4, that gives up control of the key b4 square, so we play the move knight c6. This is sort of the logical flow of things against this move king h1. Uh, so now we've looked at a few things so far, just to recap where we are. We've looked at the move 9 bishop e3 and a lot of the ideas surrounding it. We've looked at the move 9 king h1 and a lot of the ideas surrounding it. Now I want to look at a kind of strange looking idea with the move queen to d3 and the ideas uh, involved in that. So let's go ahead and move right along and jump into it. Fun, smart content. This is part one of the series, Learn the Nidorf, with me, Caleb. Uh, look for all the rest of the Nidorf lines in the coming weeks. I plan to be doing this for a while. Uh, yeah, queen d3, question mark, question mark. There will likely be a part two of the bishop e2 lines because uh, today I'm mostly focusing on the lines where white ends up castling, and there are plenty of lines where white does not castle in these variations, kingside at least. Uh, so once again, we have uh, the Nidorf starting position, I don't know why I'm making it with my mouse, when I could just scroll. Bishop e2, e5, knight b3, bishop e7, castles, castles, and now either queen d3 immediately, or bishop e3 and then queen d3 is also a very popular line, but the idea is the same. So queen to d3. What is the purpose of this strange, odd-looking move, queen to d3? Well, it's actually pretty simple. The idea is you're defending the e4 pawn. Why is it important to defend the e4 pawn? Well, because white wants to play the move knight to d5 without losing a pawn on e4. So queen d3, the idea of knight to d5. Now against this, you can actually play the move bishop e6. So this is sort of the secondary green light to play the move bishop e6. Green light number one was if you saw the move bishop e3, because then takes is fine for black after f4. Green light number two is this move queen d3. And the reason this move also allows you to play the move bishop e6 is because it makes this diagonal rather awkward for white. Meaning after f4, you do have the option to play the move b5 here. The point being, if f5, this is quite comfortable now for black. So uh, f4 would be met with b5, which is why this never really gets played. Uh, now after bishop e6, there are a few main ideas for white. One is to play the move knight d5 immediately. Another is to play the move bishop e3, which once again, you can kind of interchange these moves as, neat as you want with the white pieces. 
but it doesn't really make a difference because against bishop b3, we would have played bishop b6 anyways. Uh, so that's knight d5, bishop b3, and there's also a new idea of the move bishop to d2. So let's look at all three ideas. Uh, why don't we start here with the move uh, knight to d5? Uh, the idea here is you just immediately plant this knight on this square, and this is a perfectly fine way of playing. Uh, now, black actually does have quite a lot of options. If you want to go for simplicity, you can just play the move knight b to d7 here, and now either bishop d2 or bishop e3 are really the sensible moves for white, and these would, of course, transpose to the other lines. But the move knight d5 does actually grant you a rather unique opportunity to capture this not with the knight, uh, sorry, not with the bishop, but rather with the knight. Both of these moves are playable, but when possible, it is rather nice to take this with the knight, drop this bishop back to c8, and the point now is that without the knight on f6, black is a little bit more free to start pushing things like f5. This bishop still on the board can potentially later come out to b7, and it's just going to be a pretty free game for black. Uh, but honestly, if you want to be simple, knight bd7 transposes to the main stuff. So that's knight d5. Now let's look at first the move bishop e3. This is the most popular move, and now uh, I think the move knight b to d7 is rather sensible. Uh, if you do play the move knight to d5 here, this is the main idea. And the point now for white, by delaying knight d5 for a turn, uh, this knight has landed on the d7 square. And because of that, this is no longer an option because this bishop would find itself with nowhere to go. So that's why bishop takes knight instead. e takes. And now there are many, many, many moves here for... Uh, for black, I am going to recommend the most popular move, knight e8, with similar ideas to what we looked at. With the bishop sitting on c8, you just want to push this pawn out to, uh, to, to f5 and go about your business there. Uh, for example, a4 to kind of lock things down. And now this bishop can also come out to g5. Another added bonus of not having this knight back here on f6. Uh, now a5 still makes sense. And from here, uh, play can continue, bring your rook to c8, guarding against the c-pawn, c4, for example, and now stuff like f5 and, and g6. And it's another one of those cases where black is just going to be pushing on the king side in the center, and uh, another one of those cases where, for the moment, white's play on the queen side is uh, a little bit uh, vague, we'll say. It's, it's a little bit unclear how exactly white is coming through with these moves b4 and c5. Of course, the ideas for white are, are pretty clear. You want to play b4 and c5, but the specifics on how you're actually getting there are, are rather difficult. Uh, if these bishops get traded off the board and this knight lands on c5, I mean, how are you ever going to achieve these moves? I am not so sure. So I do quite like this position here for black. Just for an example line, bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, f4 is a good move in general for white to slow down this kind of counterplay. Queen h6, fe5, and not de5, giving white uh, killer past pawns, but rather knight e5. And this is, once again, just a playable position for black. Uh, backing on up here, uh, let's look at the move bishop d2. This is uh, sort of a newer idea. So why? put this bishop on d2 rather than the e3 square. Uh, who understands the idea of bringing a bishop out to d2? Mm -mm. You and your 600 ELO opponents will never reach this. Can I show lines from Lee Chess with uh, lower than 1,800 players one day? Uh, well, night out the... Uh, the goal of the lecture is not so much that you are consist like always reaching these exact positions. It's more that you understand the plans and the positions and the logic behind them. If you understand the logic of these moves, that's good for your chess in, in general. Uh, I will say that below 600, uh, opening lectures don't have as, as much significance. It's, at that level, it's more about principles, getting your pieces out, thing, things of that nature. 
Uh, the study is private. How do you follow along? Ah, yes, I will have to make the study public. That is, that is my mistake. So uh, right after the lecture, uh, go ahead and check out the link. Uh, for now, though, hopefully just follow along with the, uh, the video here. I, I can't, unfortunately, on the flight make it public as I am not using the account it was created on. OK, there are some ideas here to not allow f5, f4. Uh, allowing bishop takes, I, oh, he's talking about the Sozin, got it. Uh, to control b4, to not provoke d5, d4. So actually, the idea is not so much about controlling b4 here, although that is uh, a pretty interesting idea, with the point being that the square is weakened after a4. It's not so much about d5, d4, or f5, uh, f4 either. It's actually about restricting black's play on the queen side. Uh, and in that sense, it's about controlling the a5 square. Uh, because white is controlling the a5 square, now suddenly the move knight a5 is going to be an idea in many, many variations here. And this move uh, both puts pressure on the queen side pawns and kind of prevents the queen side pawns from expanding because then the move knight c6 would be rather difficult to deal with. So that is bishop d2. That is the power of bishop d2. Uh, still, though, you can just develop naturally with knight b to d7. Knight d5, of course, is the idea with queen d3. Here, we still have bishop takes d5, e takes d5. And now there are actually a couple ways to play. I kind of prefer the most direct play of playing with knight e8. Once again, the same idea we saw with bishop e3. And I'll explore it in a little bit more depth here. It really is just kind of the same. Uh, or you can kind of play against white's setup with the move a5. Uh, and this is sort of, from what I've seen, the, the safer way of playing for black. But I, I think it's also less likely to, to give you a position that, that you can uh, kind of win. So the idea of a5, of course, is you're preventing the move knight a5. And play might continue with a4, blocking the a pawn, b6, c4, knight c5, takes, takes. And it, it is a very, very safe structure for black on the queen side. But at the same time, now white is going to have time to kind of remaneuver these bishops and start aiming at black's king side as well. It's going to make it very, very difficult, I think, for black to actually get anything done with these bishops uh, always threatening to come into play if the position ever does actually open up. So I instead prefer the move knight e8. And this move sort of gives white, gives white what he wanted with this move knight a5, and now we do uh, sort of more clearly see the idea of this move. It's going to be very difficult to uh, touch these queenside pawns now for black with this knight jumping into c6 at a moment's notice. But the move rook b8 is sort of keeping the balance on the queen side, uh, just defending the b pawn. Now, for example, the move c4 is sort of what uh, white is trying to do here with b4 and c5 to follow. But now we can immediately start our counterplay on the king side with a move like f5. And just as an example line now, if b4, uh, bishop g5, is always a good idea for, for black here to activate this bishop. Bishop e1 would be preventing the trade. And already a move like e4 is coming on the board. And after queen c2, you see the, the difference here where rather than having these bishops sort of lining up to look at the king side, we have these bishops kind of stuck on the e-file, where it's true that they're controlling the queen side, but it comes at the cost of allowing black a little bit more freedom to expand over here on, on the king's side himself. So for example, a move like knight e5 is coming, a move like queen e7. And uh, for the moment, uh, I do not see the breakthrough for white, which is why I, I don't really mind allowing this move knight a5, because uh, I do think black's play on the king's side is coming in time. Uh, as I said, though, this is uh, sort of a, a little bit of a riskier approach because this is kind of the pawn structure white is aiming for. But I do think black's play is, is coming uh, quite quickly. Just as an example, queen e7, rook b1. And yeah, moves like knight e5, moves like bishop f4 even. And these pawns are going to start rolling up the board before too long. OK, so. That is sort of the idea of this 98 bishop g5 stuff, is you just start pushing these pawns in the center and go for counterplay there. Once again, the alternative, rather than 98, you can play the move a5 to stop this knight from landing on the a5 square. 
Uh, OK, how am I doing on time? 10 minutes left. We're rolling. We're rolling. So as another recap, so far we are looking at the bishop e2 line, uh, 6 e5. Uh, I am definitely not getting to the move knight f3 in this lecture, which was introduced, well, I guess not introduced, but made popular by Magnus Carlsen. Instead, the main move, knight b3, bishop b7, and we're looking at castles, castles. And here we have seen bishop e3, we have seen the move king h1, and now we have seen queen d3 in these knight d5 ideas. Uh, so hopefully you have an idea of how to play against all of those. These are really the most popular ideas here in the bishop e2 variation. And now, to wrap up the lecture, I wanted to look at one last really interesting idea by White. Rather than all of these uh, moves, which have different ideas, bishop e3, king h1, and queen d3, what if the move a4 happens immediately? And with this move, uh, let me actually click over to the next chapter here. Looking at 9a4 from the black side, with this move, once again, it's going to be a story of the b4 square. Uh, this move gives away the square on b4. Now, the most popular move here for black is actually this move bishop b6. But honestly, I'm not so comfortable with this move bishop b6, because still the move f4 is a very playable idea for white. And I do think that the move a4 is going to be uh, reasonably useful here for white, compared to the line that we looked at where you know, you could achieve this position just kind of directly without the pawn on a4. I do think this is a useful inclusion. So rather than bishop e6, I do think the move knight c6 makes a little bit more sense. Once again, pawn lands on a4, knight goes to c6 because the b4 square is weak. Uh, now there are, once again, various options here for white. Uh, let's start with the move f4 and why I think knight c6 is a little bit better than bishop e6 here. You could sort of transpose to the bishop e6 lines by taking here and just playing bishop e6. But I do think that black can do slightly better here with the nice move knight b4. And this is sort of the point of delaying the development of this bishop. Once again, now f4 comes with a less direct threat. And black has the opportunity to play moves like knight b4 going for these ideas of d5. So I don't know how many times I can say it. When the pawn lands on a4, that's the go-ahead to bring this knight to c6 and aim for these knight b4 ideas. OK, king h1. And now, once again, there are some very serious complications here. Uh, I spent some time in this position before the lecture. And I think the move d5 may actually have been playable, uh, or may be playable, but this is actually entirely untested. Uh, I think there is one game, it looks like, in the database in this position between players that were not very strong. So I didn't know if I could trust you know, my, my lowly analysis on the move d5 and be confident enough to recommend it here. But if d5 is playable, it's a really interesting try. The play might continue something like this. And after bishop f3, bishop f5, it's, it's going to be some kind of a mess here with uh, black having a weak d-pawn, white having a weak, or you know, quote unquote, slightly weak e-pawn, and good pieces in the center for black. Uh, that being said, the more tried and true method is either bringing this bishop to this diagonal via d7 and c6, or the line that I kind of prefer here with the move b6 uh, directly. Uh, bringing the bishop to b7. And why do I prefer this over bishop d7 to c6? Well, I like having this c file open so that we can put some major pieces on it and kind of challenge white's c2 pawn in, in case this ever becomes relevant. Uh, now, as someone in the chat uh, has already said, uh, you do have some ideas of bishop f3 here. Fun, smart content apparently plays this with white. Uh, and yeah, bishop f3 is the idea. Uh, rather than pawn on f3, this bishop takes the role of defending the e4 pawn against the move bishop e7, which black is obviously playing anyways. Now, bishop e3 is the natural developing idea. And black can now play the move queen c7. And this is sort of the reason I put this bishop on b7 rather than c6. Now black has very good control over the c file. And if white isn't careful, for example, in the example game I chose a move like queen d2, black can already immediately break through with the move, uh, the move d5. Now f takes e5 here would be a much, much, much better version for black because we don't 
we are already targeting this pawn, and this knight is coming here with tempo. So uh, ed5 is likely the only option. And now black has this interesting idea of playing e4 in this position to sort of solve all of his problems directly. And when the dust clears, we have knight takes e4. Uh, this knight takes d5, rather. Uh, bishop, this bishop should be saved, so bishop back to g1. And now queen takes c2. And this is just fizzling out into an equal end game uh, here for, for both sides, really. Uh, for example, queen c2, knight c2, rook c1, knight cb4. And nothing really going on here of, of any notes. Uh, for the moment, you might think that white has a slight edge in activity with this rook being here on c1 already. But all of these squares are pretty adequately covered. And given a couple moves, for example, rook uh, cd1, rook a to c8, or rook fd1 even. Uh, sorry, well, white does have to worry a little bit about this pawn. So if a move like f5, for example, already moves like knight d3 are potentially playable, and bringing a rook to the, to the open file is also going to be adequate for, uh, for black here. So the idea, once again, this pawn comes to a4. We shove this knight onto b4 in response to this uh, f4 idea. Now, f4 definitely isn't the only option here for white. You don't have to play like this. Uh, but I was just showing the difference between putting the bishop on e6 and meeting f4 with e takes f4. And now with knight c6, we have this nice option of planting the knight on b4. So let's look at the slightly less crazy ideas by white, where he doesn't go for throat kind of with the move f4. And those are uh, sort of these ideas of bishop f3 at some point, or bishop g5, or bishop e3. Sort of either of these moves combined with bishop f3 uh, makes the most sense. So let's start with bishop e3, the natural developing move. Uh, black is going to play bishop e6 now. Once again, we kind of see this green light from white, bishop e3, and now bishop e6. Uh, once again, because now white would be wasting uh, a full tempo. So rather than f4, queen d2 is uh, the sensible approach that we've seen before. Now rook c8, rook f to d1, knight b4, bishop f3. And uh, with bishop f3 here, and due to the way white has played, putting all of his pieces here to control d5, the move d5 isn't actually going to be playable in this case. We just do not have enough if my count is correct. Yes, white wins by one. So d5 isn't playable, but now, and due to the way white has played, he's put a bishop on f3 rather than a pawn, and black has this nice move knight g4. Uh, and now this bishop is too important to let die, so the move bishop takes g4 is sort of uh, obliged. Now bishop takes, hits this rook, and we have gotten rid of this pesky bishop on f3, and play is just going to kind of continue from here. For example, rook a to c1 is natural to defend this guy, and now white is still controlling d5, but we've gotten rid of this knight on f6, which means we have ideas of this in some positions, obviously not immediately. And we also have ideas of f5, which is going to be uh, the best move in this position, I believe. Uh, already f5, and once again, I think it is black with the more active play here. White in this line really has taken more of a defensive approach, just trying to prevent black's ideas. And because of that, white hasn't uh, had much success towards generating active ideas of his own. For example, knight d5 is really the only thing going for white, and we can just snip this guy off the board, play bishop d7, and it's another one of those comfortable positions for black, where immediately white already even has problems on the queen side as well. So that's bishop e3. Let's take a look at bishop f3 first. Turns out this is just sort of a different move order. Uh, knight b4 is once again our idea. a5 now is natural to prevent uh, a5 by black, solidifying this knight here. Bishop e6, bishop e3, rook c8, rook e1. And we are getting some similar stuff here where white has taken uh, a slightly different approach. We could still go for this move knight to, uh, to g4 with the idea of trying to pick up this bishop. But due to the way white has played, he can occasionally even just save this bishop with something like bishop b6 or even bishop a7. So uh, slightly easier is to instead just play the move d5 here. 
The point being, because white hasn't gone queen d2 and rook d1 directly, we have this one tempo before white lands on d2 to play the move d5. And tactically, this is just working out. e takes d5, knight b takes d5. Now if rook d2, uh, you would be met with knight takes e3 and knight takes d1. Uh, so knight takes instead. And now after bishop takes, rook d2 is met with bishop takes f3. So tactically, these rook d2 ideas just don't work. Uh, an example line, rook d2 takes, 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 takes. Uh, and after knight c5, black has an extra pawn for the moment. However, he's not really going to be able to keep it with either e5 or b7 falling. But that's not going to be enough for an advantage for white. Just for example, knight d5, rook e5, knight e3. Uh, I guess rook e3 would, would lose a knight, so f takes e3 instead. And this is just going to be a, a rather equal sort of endgame once again. So I uh, don't know how many times I can stress it. Point of a4 is to stop b5, but it gives up the b4 square. Uh, so that's bishop f3 and bishop e3, both very similar ideas. Black goes knight b4, aims for d5. If white puts all he has into stopping d5, that's when knight g4 becomes a really good move for black. So last idea here is bishop g5, as I am slightly running over time. This would run into the move bishop e6. And the idea of bishop g5 is to take off this knight, uh, preventing its control of d5 from the start, rather than keeping this bishop here on e3. Uh, unfortunately, I, unfortunately for white, I just don't think that this trade is, is actually going to be all that favorable for white. I mean, we saw knight g4 threatening to take off this bishop in another line. So white doing it voluntarily is uh, slightly uh, suspicious. The justification is that you get to play knight d5 immediately, but now simply bishop g5 by black, and this bishop is going to be an active piece here. Eventually, we'll see this knight really has no opportunities where it's at, so it'll land on either c1 or d2, and usually at that moment, you do see black take off this knight in exchange for the bishop. So uh, it's not as though now that the, light, the dark squared bishop is gone for white, this bishop is sort of going to be floating out in midair forever because it will always have the opportunity to sacrifice or I guess trade itself off for the knight on uh, currently on b3. Uh, just to continue an example line here, a5, rook c8, bishop out to g4 is a sensible idea to try and prevent uh, f5. And now in a game uh, played by Sergei Karyakin, I believe, uh, against Alexander Arush Arushchenko. Uh, he came up with the move knight b8 here. Uh, and this is sort of uh, a direct reply to how white has chosen to, to treat this position. Because of the way white has played, he gave up this dark squared bishop in exchange for this knight on d5, and this knight is doing an adequate job of defending the b4 square. So the upside for white is b4 is no longer really a problem for him. Downside, he did give up his dark squared bishop, and that's why black goes knight b8 here, sort of admitting defeat on the b4 square and now rerouting this knight to a natural square. The compensation for this, of course, is that this bishop is uh, still alive. That game continued with takes on e6, f takes e6, knight b6, and now rook c6 is a great move to defend this pawn laterally, also pressured b6 knight. Now after c3, the point of this reroute becomes clear. Uh, c6 is a better square for the rook, and this knight from d7 challenges this knight. And now trades ensued in the game, and they eventually uh, agreed to a draw, with this position not really being any worse for black, with some b5 or potentially even b6 ideas to follow. Uh, OK, so to recap here, we have uh, a few different ideas in this knight b3 and castles line for white. We have this bishop e3 idea that we looked at. And against bishop e3, that's the green light to play bishop e6. Black is going to play, be playing knight b to d7. Aim for knight b6 to c4. If white prevents this with, prevents this with a4, a5, uh, preventing both b5 and this idea of knight b6, that's when we go to this idea of, if I can find it here, of playing uh, first rook c8. Sorry, I'm falling apart here. a5 queen c7, uh, and going for knight c5 instead. So main idea, playing b5 and knight b6. a4 stops knight b5. Wow, the lines all got a little bit messed up, as they sometimes do on late chess. 
a4 preventing b5, and then a5 preventing knight b6, uh, allows us to go for a tertiary plan. I got made fun of for using that word once, but I'll continue to use it. Uh, tertiary plan of playing the move knight c5. This is the idea sort of against bishop e3. Now white also has this clever idea of playing the move 9, king h1, with a waiting move, waiting to see what black does. If bishop b6, f4 is strong. If b5, a4 is strong. So black plays b6 instead. And then either you'll see bishop e3, when we play bishop b7, f3, and only then b5, or you'll see a4 and f3, when uh, we once again, after a4, go for the b4 square. Third idea we looked at tonight is the idea of playing the move queen to d3 and going for a quick knight to d5. And the way we play against this is pretty natural, just bishop e6. And now, uh, if the immediate knight d5, knight bd7, uh, bishop d2, going for the a5 square, we take off the knight and play the move knight e8, going for counterplay on the king's side. And then finally, the last idea that we just took a look at to recap is this idea of 9a4. And once again, we fall back on these plans of playing knight c6 to b4, going for a quick d5. These are the four major variations that I introduced to you tonight. Hopefully, you're walking away with a good idea of the plans and with a reasonable uh, understanding of the exact theory as well. Thank you so much for joining me on the inaugural episode of Learn the Nidorf with me. Caleb, uh, and I will see you next time.